Until we learn how to get energy from fusion reactions, the most efficient and economical way to get it will be from nuclear power plants. Only they can provide enormous amounts of energy with minimal fuel consumption. The problem is something else. All this fuel, once it becomes spent nuclear fuel SNF, becomes a burden on our planet. It has to be disposed of somewhere and progress has to be paid for. But how can it be managed so that this fuel does not harm the planet and its inhabitants? It turns out that there are some very effective ways, other than burying it. Let's take a look at what the exhaust from a nuclear power plant turns into. What are the types of radioactive waste? First of all, we must understand that radioactive waste is generated not only from nuclear power plants, but also from other areas of human activity. For example, from research and laboratory work with radioactive isotopes, radiation therapy for cancer patients and from radioisotope thermoelectric generators RITEGs, which are used in hard-to-reach places to produce energy. Recently, though, they have been used mostly only on space stations. There is another very large source of radioactive waste, and that is the military industry, and especially the legacy of the Cold War. It is the missiles, bombs and submarines of that time that are still being recycled and pose a threat of contamination. Generally, radioactive waste is produced in hundreds of thousands of tons per year, but not only because so much fuel is produced, but because, according to IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, any industrial waste is recognized as radioactive waste if it emits more radiation than the norm. Thus, it includes equipment, machinery, cranes, special clothes, instruments, even stationary and entire cars. Everything is constantly checked according to the norms at enterprises, and before putting it out of service, there is a control measurement, and the decision is made to simply throw it away or dispose of it. By the way, let me make you happy. Contrary to popular belief, everything is dumped in Russia for next to nothing, and then buried in the Russian Far East. Moreover, since 2011 a law has been in place that prohibits the transfer across the border, both ways, of nuclear waste, except for the return of waste fuel that was produced in Russia or the USSR. This is how the requirements of contracts for the supply of fuel and equipment are enforced. Naturally, our country should have a normal number of enterprises that deal with the further fate of radioactive waste, and there are some, such as the famous P.A. Mayak. Interestingly, contrary to popular opinion, the waste is not only buried, but it is also used in other, often useful, ways. Under the secret label. In the pursuit of scientific developments mankind leaves behind quite a lot of radioactive waste. The USSR was no exception. True, in that state the side effects of research were usually carefully masked and concealed. It was believed that acid rain, mutations, incurable diseases and radiation were not about us. The exception was Chernobyl, where it was simply impossible to remain silent. So how did the Soviet Union dispose of radioactive waste? The trash at the radioactivity limit was simply dumped into the ocean. But that was not the time of the London Convention, which forbids disposing of waste in this way. There was no alternative before 1972, just throw it in the water and be done with it. However, even in the 70s, some people didn't stop. Where was the greatest amount of garbage? Two seas in particular suffered, the Barents and Caspian Seas. They received both solid and liquid nuclear fuel. Nuclear reactors and all existing radiation were also sent there. No kidding, 38,000 TBQ. To a lesser degree, radioactive waste was also dumped in the Sea of Japan and the Pacific Ocean. And part of the harmfulness of the USSR was even deposited in the Pacific Ocean. The record breaker of dead nuclear reactors is the Kara Sea. Half of them do not even have fuel unloaded. Even today it can be life-threatening. But some scientists took care of us, they filled the containers with a mixture, thanks to which radiation is contained inside and doesn't come out. But the point is that in 500 years, when the reactors are completely rotten, the harmful substances will come out. Radioactivity, approximately 85 PBQ. And the fact that the USSR, as a state, no longer exists, does not exempt from responsibility. Of course, the cemeteries of nuclear remains are located all over the world. 
Therefore, the entire planet is under threat of ecological disaster. The Nuances of Technology Civilian remains in the USSR were stored by a network of special combines. In the 60s the waste was collected, transported for storage. Today in the Russian Federation there are 15 such enterprises left. There is also a known nuclear burial ground near Chelyabinsk, the Urals, and Pishma. According to analysts, the problems of nuclear waste are only multiplying. By the way, in the USSR there was even a license for such activities. The factories had transport for different types of nuclear waste. And to dispose of it with the help of a company you had to submit an application. The factories cooperated with hundreds of enterprises. There was enough clientele. Well, the solid waste was stored in steel containers. They were installed on trucks, equipped for loading. A radiometer was obligatory, recording possible changes and the overall level of radiation. The trash was packed in such a way that it did not irradiate the employees. But any accident could have threatened tragedy. The factories were divided into storage and service buildings. But today you can't use them anymore, everything is clogged up. It turns out that we were just lied to, saying that there is no radioactive waste in the USSR, and there can't be any. Why is the nuclear fuel buried and not destroyed? We must understand that the technology now and the technology in 50 to 100 years or more is on a completely different level. On this basis, it makes sense not to engage in expensive deep reprocessing of radioactive waste now. We won't be able to fully purge them all the same, but in tens or hundreds of years, the industry may need rare isotopes that people of the future will be able to find in the very storage and burial sites that we are building now. That's how they buried the equipment in Chernobyl after the liquidation of the accident. Except that the downside was that much was stolen for parts, and now contaminated cars drive around the cities. There is also a possibility that in the future the technology will reach a new level and what we cannot recycle now would be enough to pour from a bucket, of course, exaggerated, and everything will be fine. For now, scientists are doing the best they can, but burial and recycling are in the balance, rather than seeking to recycle as much waste as possible at all costs. Alternative to Nuclear Fuel A great alternative to nuclear fuel and nuclear power plants in general is fusion reactors. In a nutshell, this technology was invented back in the 50s of the last century. It uses a tokamak, a toroidal chamber with magnetic coils. A vacuum is created in it, and instead of air, a mixture of deuterium and tritium, variants of hydrogen compounds, is pumped in. Under the influence of the magnetic field, the mixture is heated to the state of plasma, the fourth aggregate state of matter. Its temperature was as high as 11 million degrees Celsius 70 years ago. In the ITER International Tokamak, which is being built in the south of France, the plasma temperature will reach 150 million degrees Celsius. The walls of the chamber at such a high temperature do not melt just because all the plasma is in a suspended state practically in a vacuum. This technology is safe. Even tritium with little radioactivity has a half-life of only 12 years. Such a facility cannot explode even in the event of an emergency, as the pressure inside is much lower than atmospheric pressure, and if conditions are violated, plasma formation stops immediately. Even just shutting off the fuel supply will also immediately stop the reaction. The best part is that you need literally minimal fuel. For example, 80 grams of a mixture of deuterium and tritium, which are very easily obtained from simple water and cost pennies, produce as much energy as 1,000 tons of coal burned. Unfortunately, the technology cannot yet be implemented on an industrial scale, but if things go well, it will only take 10 years. After that, we could have an almost endless source of energy in the form of a small sun on Earth. And most importantly, the price of such energy will be minimal, as well as the risks of obtaining it. Subscribe to the channel and share this video with your friends. Give it a thumbs up. Tell us interesting facts you know about the topic of this video. See you in new videos.